The first lesson is from Jeremiah. Thus says the Lord, Cursed are those who trust in mere mortals and make mere flesh their strength, whose hearts turn away from the Lord. They shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when relief comes. They shall live in the parched places of the wilderness in an uninhabited salt land. Blessed are those who trust in the Lord, whose trust is in the Lord. They shall be like a tree planted by water, sending out its roots by the stream. It shall not fear when heat comes, and its leaves shall stay green. In the year of drought, it is not anxious, and it does not cease to bear fruit. The heart is devious. Above all else, it is perverse. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, test the mind and search the heart to give all <clears throat> to give to all according to their ways, according to the fruit of their doings. Psalm 1 will be read responsively. Happy are they who have not walked in the counsel of the wicked, not lingered, nor lingered in the way of sinners, nor sat in the seats of the scornful. They are like trees planted by streams of water, bearing fruit in due season, with leaves that do not wither. Everything they do shall prosper. Therefore, the wicked shall not stand upright when judgment comes, nor the sinner in the counsel of the righteous. The second reading is from 1 Corinthians. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation has been in vain, and your faith has been in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God, because we testified of God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have died in Christ have perished. If for this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all people most pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who died. If you are able, please rise. Our gospel reading comes from the gospel according to Luke and begins in the sixth chapter. Jesus came down with the twelve and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea, Jerusalem, and the coast of Tyre and Sidon. They had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all in the crowd were trying to touch him, for power came out from him and healed all of them. Then he looked up at his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven, for that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. The Gospel of the Lord. Congregation may be seated. I'll invite the, I think we've got, I guess, Nathan and Bryce.
<laughs> hey, Bryce, how are you? Good morning, good to see you. Nathan, good morning. Well, um, yeah, so boys, there's something exciting on TV tonight. Do you know what it is, Bryce? No? Nathan, you want to help him out? The Super Bowl. The Super Bowl. So there's two football teams playing, the Los Angeles Rams and the Cincinnati Bengals. I'll be talking about that more in a little bit. But um, I was just thinking about football teams and how it takes a lot of different people to do their job for the team to be able to play the game, right? You got all the different positions, all the defenders and the offensive line and the receivers and the quarterback, even all the coaches and all the trainers, all the people who, all the people who have different jobs um, for, for the team to be able to play. And I was thinking how the church is a little bit like that. You know, we have so many different people at the church. We have young people, people who are older. Uh, we have people that are retired, people who are working. Um, we have all different kinds of people, different races, different languages, um, so many different people. And it takes all of us to work together to share the good news about about Jesus. Good answer, Nathan. <laughs> Always say Jesus during the children's sermon. So. <laughs> but uh, so anyhow, boys, um, even though you guys are young, um, it also takes faithful Christians like you to pray to God, uh, to be kind to our neighbors, and to love one another. Um, so just like a football team, each one of us has an important job to do. And think about that today. You think you're going to watch the game, Bryce? Yeah. I know your dad is, that's for sure. So <laughs> let's say a quick prayer together. Dear God, I thank you so much for Bryce and Nathan and for all of our children. I thank you for their kindness, uh, their joy, and their faithfulness. And I pray, Lord, that you will help all of us uh, to work together as a team, the team of your church, to share the good news with, in word and deed with everyone that we meet. In your holy name we pray, amen. All right, thanks, guys. You can have a seat. <laughs> well, speaking of sports, <laughs> I guess sports make for easy metaphors. So I guess preachers tend to talk about sports perhaps more than we should. But have you all been watching the Olympics lately, the Winter Olympics? Yes and no, a little bit, some. I hope I didn't miss the Jamaican bobsled team yet. That's my, I've been waiting 24 years for them to be back in the Olympics. Um, I was the age of our confirmation students when that classic piece of cinema called Cool Runnings was out with the legendary John Candy. And, uh, but anyhow, they're back after 24 years. Uh, but anyhow, I was, I was thinking about this past week about the, the sort of tension that it requires for these, the athletes of that caliber, you know. And they're under such immense pressure to, to perform at the highest level. Um, there are so many people watching them. Uh, some of these people, their, their whole country is hoping that they're going to win. And so the expectations are so high. Um, but yet, on the other hand, they have to relax, right? <laughs> you know, if you're an athlete and you are too nervous, um, you're likely to make a mistake, uh, to fall. Um, and even with training, right? It's like, on the one hand, you have to train extremely hard to be a professional athlete uh, or to be an Olympic athlete. But at the same time, if you train too hard, you can risk getting an injury. But if you don't train hard enough, <laughs> you're not going to succeed. So it's, there's a real tension there. Um, there's a real tension. There's a very fine line these athletes must walk. Um, recently, I was reading, I was reading uh, some books about space uh, with my son, Nathan, and it's, it was talking about how the astronauts have to exercise for like two hours a day, <laughs> two or three hours a day. But the reason for that is because there's no gravity in space. And so if they don't exercise, their muscles become weak. And then when they come back to Earth, they're hardly even able to stand up uh, because of the lack of tension, the lack of... Um, resistance in their lives. So the reason I mention that is that I think there's a lot of tension 
in today's gospel story. Um, We hear Jesus pronouncing blessings on those who are poor, um, those who are hungry, those who are persecuted. And at the same time, he's pronouncing woes. He has words of warning for those who are wealthy, um, those who are well spoken of. And this is a difficult text to, to hold in balance. Because on the one hand, we know that God does not want people to be poor. We know that God does not want people to be hungry, um, to be mistreated. Um, At the same time, um, if you're like me, every once in a while you fantasize about winning the lottery. (laughs) And yet we know that money cannot buy us happiness, right? Um, And we've probably had that experience before of someone praising you excessively and you think, what is this guy selling, (laughs) right? Uh, we worry about you know, people speaking sometimes too kindly of us. So there's a real tension in this text between sort of the way we want things to be in the world, uh, the way that we know things are, but then also the way Jesus tells us that God operates in the world and the way God's kingdom is breaking into this world and transforming this world. Jesus at first speaks a blessing to to those who are hungry, um, excluded, um, forgotten, uh, mistreated. And if you've ever felt that way, you know that it doesn't feel good, right? Um, And I think what Jesus is telling us is that God's kingdom operates under a different set of values. God's kingdom operates in a different way than what we are accustomed to in the world. Um, when, When people are poor, um, when they're excluded, when they're hated or, or, or mistreated, they're being denied of their humanity. Um, they are being told and, and treated as if they are less valuable than any other human being that God has created. And Jesus, when he was telling this to his disciples and the people who had come from all over the region, both, both Jews and Gentiles, He was telling them that in God's kingdom, your value is not determined by any worldly measure of success, but you are valued and loved and you will be provided for in God's kingdom simply because you are one of God's beloved children. Um, At the same time, Jesus has, throughout the Gospel of Luke especially, he has words of warning um, for those who are Uh, well-to-do. We talked about this a little bit a couple weeks ago. And uh, the the message that Jesus consistently tells these people is that if you have wealth, be very careful. Be very careful because it can can ruin your life. Um, Wealth in itself is not bad, but boy, I mean, um, I I can't speak from experience, (laughs) but it can be hard to handle, right? I mean, um, there's a lot of people that you see them in the paper, they've won the lottery, and I think I really hope it doesn't ruin their life. Because when you wake up and you have millions of dollars one day, um, you'll find yourself living in a very different world. I think the confusion comes from this word that Jesus keeps repeating, blessed. You know, blessed are you. Um, And I want to give you just a quick um, sort of um, vocabulary lesson, but uh, this is from one of my favorite uh, sources to quote, but from uh, Pastor Brian Stoffergen, a retired Lutheran pastor, and he was a very skilled... um, person with the, with the Greek uh, texts, because of course the New Testament was written in Greek, as our confirmation students were learning last week. And the word for blessed in, in ancient literature, it had a couple different meanings. And at first the word blessed was used to refer to all the Greek and Roman gods. They were considered the blessed ones because they lived in the heavens, they were far removed from any kind of suffering, uh, their lives were lives of, of pleasure and and joy and happiness. And so the the gods were referred to as the blessed ones. But over time, it took on another meaning. And people, once they had died, even average people were referred to as the blessed ones because they were at rest from their labors. Um, They were no longer struggling and toiling in this life of, of demands and busyness. So then the word blessed took on a meaning of of those who had died and rested in peace. But finally, in the time of Jesus, the word blessed had taken on a third meaning, and it came to mean the elite, the well-to-do, those who are politically powerful, 
um, those, who, those who were wealthy, who had vast estates and, you know, the, the 1% of their day um, because they were, they were considered blessed because they were far removed from the cares and concerns of the common people. Um, so Jesus had a sort of completely uh, reevaluated what it meant to be blessed and said, you who are relying on God now, you are the ones who are, who are truly blessed. And um, this past week as I was thinking about this, I, was, um, I remembered an article I had read uh, a couple years ago about a man named Chuck Feeney. Uh, and has anyone ever heard of him? <laughs> okay, well, he's, he was a very, he's a very interesting man. He's still alive. Um, he's 91 years old, and he lives in San Francisco uh, with his wife. But Chuck Feeney was born in 1931 in New Jersey, and he was born to a very modest household. His parents were Irish-Americans. I think they were just kind of you know, blue-collar family. And uh, Chuck Feeney, he joined the Air Force. Um, he was a radio operator in the Korean War. And as, when, when he got out of the Air Force, he sort of went into business. And he started a business of, sell, of opening the of duty-free and tax-free stores. So it started out with selling tax-free alcohol um, to people overseas. And he had a company that was called the Duty Free Shopping Group. Um, and over the years, this, this company spread all around the world and became one of the, perhaps the largest retailer um, within the, the airline industry. And so his company was making millions and then eventually billions of dollars. And so when he was in his 50s, this is back in the early 80s, um, he was very impressed. He read an essay that had been written by Andrew Carnegie. And Carnegie said that it was a shame for anyone to die with wealth. <laughs> Most of us won't have that problem, <laughs> I think. But, you know, he was talking about being extremely wealthy. And he said, wow, I'm, I'm 50 years old. I literally have billions of dollars. I got to start getting rid of my wealth. Um, because he was thinking about, what should I do with all this? So in 1982, he founded a group that was called the Atlantic Philanthropies Fund. And he, his, his business partners did not know this, but he transferred all of his share in the duty-free shopping uh, company, which at that time was about $500 million. He transferred all of his shares of the company. Um, they were being held by this trust. No one knew this. And then over the next 30 years, he set out to get rid of all of his money and he donated, by the end of his life, he had donated over $8 billion um, in charity. And most of it went to universities and for like healthcare and childcare and things like this. And so um, it only came out many years later when um, he had sold all of his, it came out by accident, he had sold all of his shares in uh, the Louis Vuitton Hennessy Corporation of a luxury brand company. And that's when people first realized that he was, he was giving away his fortune. And so he acquired a nickname. He, he became known as the James Bond of philanthropy because of his secret, secretive nature and clandestine nature of giving away all his wealth. So if anyone was blessed or blessed by worldly standards, it was Chuck Feeney. It was a true rags to riches story. Um, he acquired more wealth than any of us could possibly imagine what to do with. But then he spent the whole later half of his life getting rid of it <laughs> and giving it to others to, to make communities a better place. And, and now he just lives in a two-bedroom apartment. I think I read in an article that he has, he has just enough money in the bank to live off the interest. Um, and he lives in a two-bedroom apartment with his wife. So that, I think, is what Jesus is talking about when he's warns us about the dangers of wealth, uh, but also promises blessings to those who are in need. Back in Jesus' day, the blessed did other things with their wealth. Um, of course, we all know that Jesus lived um, in the days of the Roman Empire, and um, one of the ways that the Romans kept people happy, that kept them, they kept them entertained, was with circuses. Now, not like the Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus, but the Roman circuses were like chariot races and perhaps most famously, the gladiators, the gladiatorial combat. Um, there, was, there was a recent issue of National Geographic magazine 
that said the gladiators, they said it was much more like WWF wrestling than it was actually killing each other. <laughs> it was much more for entertainment than it was actual violence. But uh, there, was a, there was a poet, a Roman poet, who said very famously, if you give the people bread and circuses, they will never rebel against the empire. And so basically the idea was that if you give people just enough food, if you give the average person just enough food to eat and keep them entertained with chariot races and gladiators, they're not really going to ask the tough questions about society. They're not really going to notice what we, the blessed ones, the 1% are doing uh, with all the wealth and with all the power um, in, in our society. So again, a uh, very different message that Jesus was preaching us, was preaching to those people today. So in our world today, we don't have bread and circuses, but we do have chicken wings and the Super Bowl, right? <laughs> and hog maw, if you're going to Fanny's house. <laughs> We don't have bread and circuses, but we do have chicken wings and the Super Bowl. If you're like me, I'm, I'm going to be watching the game later. We're, we're having some barbecue later. But the truth is, we're going to be watching millionaire athletes playing, <laughs> playing football. We're going to be watching some stupid commercials that each cost about $10 million because it's the Super Bowl. Um, and, you know, it's like... I'm wondering, is this our bread and circuses today <laughs> as we're sitting there eating our chicken wings and watching the game? Um, perhaps there's more important questions we should be asking about how we spend our time and our money. And um, I just want to tell a quick story. But um, So back in 1990, I think I usually tell this story almost every, every year, but uh, it was back in 1990, a pastor named Brad Smith, uh, he's a Presbyterian pastor in South Carolina, and he had a prayer in, his, in church where he said, uh, dear Lord, um, as we, as even today, as we watch the Super Bowl football game, help us to remember those who do not even have a bowl of soup to eat. And then someone came and said, oh, that was a great prayer. We should start a charity, you know, collecting money on Super Bowl Sunday to provide food for those who are hungry this day. And so they started this thing called Super Bowl of Caring. It's spelled S-O-U-P-E-R, Super Bowl of Caring. And it spread to other churches in the area. They had the youth group was very involved with this. And now it's like all across the country. And since 1990, Super Bowl of Caring has raised over $150 million to help those who are hungry and those who are in need. So it all started just with this one church um, in South Carolina, this one simple prayer. Um, and now again, $150 million later, um, that has all gone to help uh, people who are in need. So today, I'll invite you all in a little bit. You will have your chance to vote for the Los Angeles Rams. And so far, no one is showing, they only got a couple dollars in there. No one's showing any love for LA. Or you can root for the Cincinnati Bengals. Um, I put my donation on this side earlier. I don't mean to tip the scale. We'll see who will win. Um, but. There's some tension in being a Christian, right? Um, there's some tension in being a Christian. It's hard, following Jesus is not easy because he calls us to make sacrifices. He calls us to care and love for those people that are often overlooked. But at the same time, I think we all know and trust that following Jesus is the way to a blessed life, um, to a deeper, more meaningful life um, with our neighbors, with God, with our families, and, and for ourselves. So as we enjoy the game later today, may we remember those um, who do not even have a bowl of soup to eat, and may we all ask for God's guidance as we seek to be better followers of Jesus. May God bless you all. Amen.